everyone, and welcome once again to one of our uh, Hobby Memorial Library virtual events. We apologize for the slight delay, but we've got it all going. We have Texas A&M Associate Professor and Extension Range Specialist, Dr. Baron Rector, who's going to talk to us about some invasive species. So welcome, Dr. Rector, and I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you very much, Cindy. And uh, I'm going to hit the share button and go right back to this PowerPoint. Okay. So are, am I on the screen? Well, we don't, not yet. Do you see the share button? Uh huh. I, I hit it already. Hold on. Huh. Now it says starting your meeting. Uh oh. Go back to the bottom. and click on which button. Oh, I found it. Okay. Okay, my share says I'm already sharing. Um, okay, go to the bottom and find the meeting again. And hit the join meeting again. Uh, yeah, go ahead and do that. Okay, hold on. So you don't you don't see my screen at all? No, sir. There we go. All right, let's do it. Okay. Very good, ladies and gentlemen. And it is a wonderful opportunity uh, for me to be talking to you uh, from San Angelo, Texas today. I'm not actually on the A&M campus, uh, but I want you to see in my title uh, that I am Extension Range Specialist and I'm a support person uh, for all the county extension agents in the state of Texas related to rangeland rangeland management, rangeland ecology, and I, I have served in many capacities uh, related to invasive organisms in the state of Texas, and most recently I have served uh, the last 10 years on the Texas Invasive Species Coordinating Committee that is a committee that makes recommendations to the Texas Department of Agriculture and our State Soil and Water Conservation Board about invasive organisms that are here in the state. And so who, who keeps up with this? Who is in charge of dealing with threatening noxious, that means that they could be native, or invasive, which might imply that they're foreign to our ecosystem that we live in. Who's in, who's in charge of that? Who's out there looking in everybody's yard every day or, or driving the landscape of Texas on the 169 million acres and look at what all the industry, the agriculture, the homeowners, the cities, the counties, and the new people moving into our state who's monitoring what they're bringing in. So we know our largest group that monitors products that come into the state of Texas is the United States Department of Agriculture Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and the Division of Plant Protection and Quarantine, PPQ. Uh, we have about 400 inspectors that work on all the ports of entry, whether it be a boat and be down in the Houston Ship Channel 
or it's an airline from another country landing at the DFW airport up between Dallas and Fort Worth. So how many eyes do we need in a fast-changing pace uh, in life that's occurring right now? Everything is changing. So the change is normal. And so can you reflect on what might have been the very first invasive plant that we had to deal with in the United States since we began settlement uh, in the hemisphere and in North America around 1607. Can you, can you think of what it might have been? Because uh, the birds did not fly across the ocean. There were no boats coming to North America. There was no one bringing anything into this continent, uh, and the Indians had already been here from 6,000 to 36,000 years, and we know that they came from three gene pools that are associated with Asia. So what did they bring? We have no idea, and, and I have to look at the third word here. What does the word native actually mean? If I look at the CTC campus, what's native on the campus? If I go across to Fort Hood, what is actually native over there? Who did the, in 1823, when Stephen F. Austin got the uh, Moses' Austin land grant, and he got it approved in Mexico City to bring European and American settlers to Texas, uh, what was already in the state? What were we already facing? Did the American Indians bring invasive plants in? So which weed, if you go and look it up on the Internet, was the first and major invasive plant that we've had to deal with over on the Atlantic coast, predominantly in North and South Carolina? And to this day, even though we battled that plant with all the technology that we have, that non-native invasive witch weed is still here today. So to give you an animal example, uh, and I'm going to talk predominantly about plants, but to give you an animal example, think about when the world of the West uh, tried to give Australia help in controlling Central American prickly pear that had taken over 110 million acres of Australia. So we went into South America. We found a moth that lays eggs on the prickly pear pads. And when the larvae hatch, they go inside the pad, eating the pad and ultimately destroying the pad. So that became a biological control agent. Well, when that moth was released in the Caribbean to control unwanted non-native prickly pear on, on an island. The moth has ultimately escaped, went through the Caribbean islands from the island of Nevis, and entered Key West, Florida in about 2004. And immediately a red flag went up because here was a introduced invasive insect that was on the United States uh, and, and APHIS's list of insects to watch for that we did not want it. Well, when it entered into Florida, and you look at, we have three species of invasive prickly pear, I mean native prickly pear, that are on the endangered list, and that this moth, if it came in, could lay eggs on the endangered prickly pear and destroy them and take them off of the endangered list and put them on the extinct list. So so think about what we're having to deal with. And, and I want to show you some things about what is happening in Texas. So threatening plants. What does it mean? I've asked this question to professionals and land managers at meetings 
plant identification contests for years, and I usually get concerns from people about local, maybe even regional, and then the current issues of the day on rangeland, crop fields, natural areas, flood control district lands, government refuges, large and small ranches, wildlife hunting operations, equine estates, suburban homeowners with pocket prairies, and many others. Because when people see something that they're not able to identify, then they think it's non-native and it's invasive. Only after they get it named can they go look on the internet or read in the book about the biology and the history of a plant and what man has written down. So threatening plants have always been the brush and weed species that do not meet the goals of an individual land ownership and are perceived to be bad and have negative impact on the land, the people, the society, and the earth ecosystem. But realistically, all of the threatening plants are native to the earth ecosystem and have value in that system. We haven't found any plants today from the moon from Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, or Saturn. Everything that we deal with that we know of today is a native of the Earth ecosystem. So what has man done in his quest to make a fortune? Haven't we moved the plants of the world around? And when you think about a fruit that you eat called citrus fruit, you have lemons, limes, orange, tangerines, tangelo, grapefruit, mandarin oranges. Where are they all native to? And the first thing people think of is down in the Rio Grande Valley, we raise a lot of lemons, limes, grapefruit, and oranges, and they go Texas. And I tell them, absolutely incorrect. And then another person will say Florida. And I say, absolutely incorrect. And then the third major area for growing citrus is California. They say California, and I say, absolutely incorrect. Because all of the citrus that we know and that we eat and is for sale at Lowe's and HEB and affiliated foods, they're all from Southeast Asia. None of them, of the citrus that we eat, are native to this hemisphere. So, how can life be confusing in the mind of man until I have enough knowledge about something to say anything about it and what the land is doing? So, look at this quote from Edwin Spencer in 1940. Uh, and he wrote in a book called Just Weeds, Spencer stated that a weed is a plant out of place in the eye of man. In the struggle for existence, a bad weed is a prince. It has the traits of a Bonaparte or Hitler. Give it an inch and it'll take a mile, all because nature has endowed that plant with super vitality, as well as with a few characters that make it useless to man and beast. This is the nature of the worst weeds. No matter what we do, we have a hard time getting them under control and getting rid of them because they are out to get us. So Spencer, he also stated, the need of weed control is everywhere. But few appreciate that, uh, that need until some weeds make life miserable for them, and then they do not know what to do about it. So think about walking out around your apartment, walking around the, the Killeen campus, uh, walking down the highway, go over to the tennis courts, go over into Copper's Cove and go eat a hamburger at the Burger King. Every square inch that you went over has non-native plants today. It, the dandelion is not a native here. It's a native of Europe. 
And when I saw it in Austria and Germany and Switzerland, the, the dandelion is as big as three basketballs tall. It's, it's up to five feet in diameter. What do our little dandelions that are a native of Europe, what do they look like? They're small. They may get up to a foot tall, eight inches wide. But see, the United States and Colleen and Texas are not its home. And so the things that it needs in its environment to look like it does where it grows naturally, those characteristics of the environment, the soil, the weather, they're not here. We're in Texas. So it's, it's good to know that we already have in our generation and, and the people who are alive today, we have weeds everywhere. And this, they grow in the cracks of the sidewalk. They grow up and down the foundation of the house. They, they get in every flower bed that we create. Man has a hard time making it here. So in a quote from 1859 by William Darlington in a book that he wrote, American Weeds and Useful Plants, Darlington stated, the labors of the agriculturist are a constant struggle. On the one hand, by presenting the most favorable conditions possible, he endeavors to make certain plants grow and produce to their utmost capacity their genetic potential. And on the other hand, he has to prevent the growth of certain other plants that are ready to avail themselves of the same favorable conditions that I made to grow the corn, to grow the cattle to grow the tomato in a pot or out in my garden. And all these weeds come up. So we should conclude that the talk about the top 10 most threatening weeds and brush in Texas is not only to visit plants that are threatening, but to include the human manager and his or her understanding and knowledge in this discussion. People usually don't get too excited over plants as they don't walk, run, or fly unless man and technology are involved. So plants, well, it's not going anywhere. I won't, I won't, I won't work on it today. I'll put it off into the future. And after it's flowered five or ten times, the seed are in the soil, and then we can never get rid of it. So my first point is to look at the word threatening, and threatening is defined as to express a threat against, to serve as a threat to, such as to endanger, or to be a bio-menace in our life, or to give signs or warning, or a portend, or giving or expressing threats of danger or other harm. So think, we put that word threatening that we think it's threatening because it could potentially cause harm on the land or harm to people. Point two, a threatening bush, brush, or weed species in one instance might be a valuable plant species in another situation. I have to keep that in mind. And so something I think is bad, my neighbor might love it. And he wants it in his yard while you may think it's threatening and you're out there trying to get rid of it. So point three is most of the time the terms weed and brush are used in a context to imply that these species are unwanted and that they get in the way of reaching our personal goals. These two terms are used by individuals in ranching and farming and as well as in park management for the city, the county, the state, or the federal government, but are also used by developers, urban lawn managers, refuge managers, road and highway managers, city and county park managers, flood control districts, wildflower growers, etc. Weed and brush. And so when the man looked at his wife and said, Honey, look at all the weed, weeds and brush. What did that man just tell his wife? That he did not know the name of any of them 
but he knew that they were plants that he did not want on the land because they weren't useful in reaching his gold. So think think about what what we're actually dealing with. So most threatening brush and weeds, what do they do on the land? Do these plants poison and kill people and other animals because these threatening and invasive species are here? Are there people dying out in the street right now at Colleen? Let's say we know that to be poisoned by a plant, it's only poisonous if you eat it. And so think about the animal that comes up and takes a big bite out of a poisonous plant and it walks away about five yards and the plant, I mean, the animal drops dead right there. What do you think the plant is thinking? The plant's looking at the animal. It walked away after taking a big hunk out of it and it laid down and died. And here's what the plant thinks. The plant says, well, I guess he ain't coming back. And see, to be poisonous in this light is a strategy of survival. So the USDA Poisonous Plant Lab at Provo in Logan, Utah, has declared that all plants of the earth are poisonous. Poisonous to something. Because to be poisonous is a strategy of survival. So look at the monarch butterfly and, and our craze to go plant milkweeds. Milkweeds are poisonous to cattle and to sheep and to goats and to humans, but not to the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly on its migratory path lays eggs on the broadleaf milkweed or, or any of our species of Asclepius, the larvae hatch. Out of the egg, they eat the entire plant, the leaves, the stem, the fruit, the flower, the roots, and have no ill effect. That means that is an animal that is supposed to be working with that plant. So the black swallowtail, it can eat parsley where you and I cannot eat much parsley because it has a ferrano coumarin in it. And if I eat too much parsley, parsley as a garnish, other than a garnish, that ferrano coumarin will destroy my liver. And if I have no liver, I'm dead. So do you realize you eat poisonous plants every day and that the seeds of the apple have cyanic acid in them? And if you eat enough of the seeds, you're dead. So how do we how do we create an environment of change where we understand and we work with all these plants that are occurring in the environment? Do the plants create a change that we cannot recover from? Do they does the mesquite take over? Does the Wesatch take over uh, native plants to Texas so that we cannot get our land back or have a healthy water cycle. See, all these things are interconnected. And look at number five. Do these plants threaten endangered species? Well, I just gave you an example about an insect that it, from South America, the Cactoblastis cactorum, the cactus moth, my example in Australia, that moth is a native moth in southern Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. But it's not native up here in North America. But it eats the same kind of plant. The genus Opuntia, the prickly pears, the plants that have a cladophyll stem instead of a round or triangular stem. It has a pad that is photosynthetic. So look at number six. Do these plants threaten our natural water cycle, streams and rivers, and fresh and saltwater estuaries? Do they change the fate of rainfall? And rain is the number one limiting and critical element in the state of Texas right now because we are up to 30.7 million people. And if we go back into a drought cycle, where's the water going to come from? See, so the, this issue with noxious and invasive plants is at the same level. So do these plants concentrate toxic chemicals 
in the soil. That's why we've attempted to get rid of some plants because we deem that they might kill out other plants. Well, finding out about the top 10 most threatening brush and weeds when I first came to work for the Texas Agricultural Extension Service in 1981, I quickly learned that the number one most threatening plant in Texas is honey mesquite. Prosopis glandulosa, variety glandulosa, and that it was the most threatening plant for our Texas cattlemen, our range landowners. And yet, if I go to Corpus Christi, the honey mesquite, this plant, is for sale at Turner's Nursery as a landscaping plant because it is adapted to the area. They're selling it. And yet, if I go and look at Fort Hood, what is the native plant there that has taken over the landscape? It, the, the ash juniper or the blueberry cedar, juniperus ashii, but it's a native plant. So although research shows that dealing with the honey mesquite, uh, the seed are only viable for about 12 months. And when I look at the ash juniper, it's the same thing. The seed are only viable once they fall on the ground for 12 to 18 months. So most of the state grows this native woody lagoon, except when did we find the first mesquite? The first mesquite was sampled by botanists in 1832 below the Canadian River in the Panhandle. Because, see, a lot of people want to believe that the honey mesquite is not native and that came in with cattle drives from Central or South America. But the first specimen, if we started settling Texas in 1823, he described this plant as 20 foot tall and with a basal stem diameter of 14 inches. 1823 to 1832 is only nine years. No mesquite gets that big in nine years. So it's been perceived, though, that the mesquite robs the soil of water for growing grass and blocks out the sun that is needed for all full sunlight grasses to grow, thus lowering the productivity of the land and reducing the income of the rancher. Then I got to visit a ranch, work and gore goats, and eat lunch in the ran ranch owner's home at a mesquite plank table that sat 20 people. I casually asked the owner how much the six-inch plank mesquite table cost. This is in 1978, and he said the table cost $50,000 for something that we think is a threatening plant, and that each of the 20 mesquite chairs made out of the heartwood of mesquite, they cost $2,000 a piece. So value and threatening took on a new meaning for me that day. Was mesquite telling us a story of land change, or was it here to destroy the land? See, there's a difference here. When I learn about the ecology and the biology of plants, when they get out of balance, what is that telling me? Is that telling me that I'm doing something that has changed the land? And that's indeed exactly what has happened for both honey mesquite and ash juniper. So, it is interesting to note that in the recordings of early Texas naturalists in the 18th and 19th century, that none of them stated that Texas had a brush and weed problem. But as progress and the many changes in the lands have occurred from human management, the threatening species have appeared on the Texas landscape. These are generally noted by questions asked by landowners, and we have recommendations for some of them in the world of herbicides and chemical control in an extension bulletin which is now REM 1466, uh, 
chemical weed and brush control guidelines for rangelands. But let's look at the number two thing about these threatening plants. The most common threatening plants were mesquite, wesatch, McCartney rose, sand sage, prickly pear, tassahia, dog cactus, red berry juniper, ash juniper, cat claw, common broom weed, western ragweed, broom snake weed, sacawista, coyotea, black brush, wahia, tar bush, and creosote bush. Note that these threatening species to the livestock industry, they affect the fate of rainfall, but they also may be tied to Texas wildlife species. So even though they may hinder the growing of grass, uh, white-tailed deer only eat 9% of their diet is grass annually. 91% they're eating the herbaceous plants or the woody plants. Or if I live in Webb County at Laredo, 15% of the annual diet of a white-tailed deer is prickly pear. See, a plant that ranchers are trying to get rid of. So many of these things are in the eye of the beholder on what the value and what should we assign a definition of something to. So remember, 1973, Drucker described management as the art and the science of making the correct decision. He said the tools of management include seeding, unwanted plant control, prescribed burning, control of livestock numbers, the time of grazing, build, building fences, building cute little ponds. But he said those are the tools of management, and they're not management. Management is being able to see something that is out of balance, and then I select tools to help me to get it back into balance. So here, how do we feel about all these plants? And look at these two crusty old ranchers sitting down at the bank down in Uvalde, Texas, and they're pointing their finger at you and saying, management, it's selecting the right things to do. So if we have a problem in plants, didn't we see it coming? Didn't we see the density of mesquite go from one or two per acre to 500 per acre? Well, what's the matter with y'all? Can't y'all see the land? Can't you see what's happening on the land? But this is why you're in college. It's to learn more about how to see what is out there on the land. And my little tidbits here today or to help you to get into a different perspective. So look at this plant. Land managers could not always name the threatening plant. What is the name of the plant is in this picture? Is it a weed? Is it an invasive organism? Or is it a native plant? And it's out there in the month of March. And so we learn that the first thing that we have to do in ecology and biology, and ranching, and farming, and wildlife management, is I have to identify and name that threatening plant, because the name is the key to finding all knowledge about it. If I can't name it, I can't see it. It's just green, yellow, purple, black, orange, or red, and until I can name it, I can't go look it up in a book or on the internet and find out everything that man has discovered about it. But look at the plant before I just, the stage before. It's in a winter rosette. It came up in the fall and then, then and, and it hugs Mother Earth to, to absorb the heat and it's not killed by our winters. And then look, it goes to flower in the spring. And this is Enothera cerulata the the three-lobed evening primrose. Now, how would we know that if I hadn't taken uh, courses that helped me learn how to name organisms of importance on the landscape? But it was in this rosette, so would the guy have named it an evening primrose name if this is all he encountered on the day that he saw it? If it didn't have a flower, 
what, what, would man have named the Texas Blue Bonnet if he had only seen the winter rosette? If it had no flowers, why would he name it a Blue Bonnet? Why would he name it Blue? So people have named these things on every single day of the life of the organism. When it was in an egg, when it was a larvae, when it was a pupae, when it was an adult. So I have to know all that. I have to be able as a land manager and to work in the biology of the land, I have to be able to identify an organism at every stage of growth. So this is very important. So if you can't name it, you can't see it, it's just green, yellow, purple, orange, black, or red. The plant name is the key to all information about the plant. So look in the very center of this picture. The plants that we deal with are adapted to their environment that is constantly changing. So there is an area neuron grass, uh, I'll think of the common name of it here in a minute, growing on the left in the top, but look in the middle, matching the rock is an aerial corpus fissulata called the rock cactus. And when I look at this cactus, 97% of the plant is below ground. Because see, in the desert, that is out in the Trans-Pecos and beginning at San Angelo and over at Sweetwater and going to Midland and Odessa and all the way to El Paso, plants must be adapted to living without the frequency of rainfall that you're used to. They live in the 14-inch rain belt. Colleen is in the 26 to 28 inch rain belt. Interstate 35 is in the 30 inch rain belt. I live in College Station in the 40 inch rain belt. Whatever grew here naturally in any of these locations is adapted to the soil and to the climate. But plants protect themselves. Plants have things about them to live through the changes of the land. So look at this plant this rosette in January in the middle of the picture. Can you name this plant? And it and you go, no, no, I, I, I've never learned that plant. Where's the flower? I, you know, I use my wildflower book to name all these plants. Well, if it doesn't have a flower on it, uh, maybe you're going to miss the best time to manage the plant because it might be this stage of growth right here in the winter rosette and look at the shape of the leaves they look like a spoon with a spoon handle and then the open part for picking up my chicken and rice soup and so what does it look like and this is january here's what it looks like at the end of march and going into april can can you name it now look at the big water sucking leaves that it has all over the plant and you look at it and go, no, it doesn't have a flower on it. I don't even have any idea what family it's in. And so now we look at it out on the land, and everything in this picture that you can see that's green is this same plant. And this is what it looks like in August. And then in its life and life circle, it is going to flower in late August and September, and it's going to look like this. Now, it, has, it is a sunflower, but look at the stem of the plant on the far right. It has no leaves on it because the plant had water using leaves in the spring, but when the heat of summer came on, all the water using leaves fell off. It couldn't afford to lose that much moisture, so it went to micro-sized leaves up in those branches of the flowering heads and where the inflorescence is. So look at it in this cage. This is the same plant up up at uh, outside of Palo Pinto, Texas, going toward Granbury, and look inside the cage. None of this plant is growing in the cage, but it's growing outside the cage because the way we promote this plant is to overeat the grass. And so man, through his good understanding of land management, mows too much, eats too much, and then Mother Nature's bailiwick of recovery plants to cover bare soil come up. 
to reduce the impact of a raindrop that's coming out of the sky at 32 feet per second squared. That's a lot of kinetic energy. And if it hits bare ground and throws the soil in the air and the soil ends up in moving water, that is the fifth grade Teeks definition of erosion by wind and water. See, all these things are interconnected. So the plant you're looking at is the one on the left with this rounded uh, top. But look at the one on the right. It has the same name, but it's two different plants. They're both called common or annual broomweed. But one is Amphichyrus, and the other one is in the genus Dracunculoides. But man named them the same. And so the key here is the plant on the left. The seed only germinate in the fall. The plant on the right, its seed germinate in both the fall and the spring. So the man thought he had the plant on the left, and he went and did a February prescribed burn, and all the seedlings were burned up. So he said, I'm going to be clean of that plant, but by the middle of August, his land was still yellow, like in that last picture, because of the plant on the right that has a second germination period. See, what do we learn about plants before we get too excited over them? And so look on the left. This is a pasture grazed with one goat to the acre. This fence was put in for this study, and the pasture on the right is a, is a pasture grazed by three goats to the acre for the same 90-day period. Can you see the difference in management of stocking from one goat to three goats for 90 days, I create a different look in the land. So our management, it's learning how to identify something out of balance and then correct the tools. But what about the plants that are not native to an area? If these are threatening plants, shouldn't the government be working on these plants and going out there every day and getting rid of them before they harm us and our environment? But their name on a noxious, put their name on a noxious or invasive plant list. See, even where we have government money to go out and control and manage mesquite and ash juniper, not everybody's taking advantage of it because man that settled in Texas came in from Europe. Europe has no grasslands. In North America, we have grasslands. None of Western Europe, Germany, Spain, Italy, Greece, all the way up to the Netherlands, there are no grasslands. They're forest land. So the people who came as the first settlers to the hemisphere, to North America, came out of the forested land of the earth. And so they look at trees as something that's normal. But on the grasslands of Texas, the grass, the prairie, the definition says that it's a rolling to nearly flat plain of land and was treeless in the beginning. Now, how about that? And y'all are over there planting trees trying to save the earth on Arbor Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, so if they're threatening, so... An invasive species by Executive Order 13,112 signed by President Bill Clinton in 1999 states this. Invasive species is defined as non-native or alien to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm are harm to human health. Now, in recent years, man has altered this to include some native plants. Because, see, where's the money? Where's the money that can be used to go out and control something? So they took the word non-native to the clean, 
to Coriel County, to Bell County, to Lampasas County, the plants that are native there that are causing havoc on the land, and they're trying to force them into Executive Order 13,112. And so do we have enough money to even fund that? And it's questionable. So the word invasive is usually defined as meaning intrusive, invading, offensive to us as humans. To be invasive may imply that the organism has never occurred on a specific site or in a certain niche before or prior to the first introduction. So the McCartney Rose in South Texas and all the way up to Texarkana, it is a native of Japan and China, and we call it invasive because it was never native here before. So invasive plants are those that have a tendency to spread and invade healthy landscapes, ultimately causing some kind of negative impact. Because they invade a healthy landscape. Everything will invade an unhealthy landscape, but if it has the power and the strategy to invade a healthy landscape, we can't handle that because we believe that our not that our native organisms have the strength to keep aggressive non-native stuff out. Okay? So look at C. Invasive plants are often best defined as plants that do not stay where they are planted. And so what moves? Is the crepe myrtle moving? Is the Chinese privet hedge moving around? Is the red tip photemia moving? Is the Bermuda grass moving? Is the Bahia grass moving? Is the rye grass moving? See, all these have become a problem. Even the chast tree has made its way all the way around Lake Buchanan over in Burnett and, Lam and uh, the adjoining county uh, along the shore, and they've altered it where man can't get down to the bank and fish. So think about what what these things are doing and what, what these definitions mean because the best definitions are in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary printed in 1965. See, plant... So categories of Texas invasive plants. Plants brought to Texas for food production or the or our livestock production, but they've escaped cultivation. Plants brought to Texas for the beauty or landscape value by the horticulture and the nursery industry. Plants brought to Texas as novelty plants for plant collectors and gardeners. Oh, look, I, I went on safari in Africa and I found this article. I found this orchid and I snuck it back through customs because it's illegal in the United States. But at the Dallas Orchid Club, they all went, oh, my God, you, you've got that orchid. You're the only one in the state of Texas to have that orchid. And that was moments before the person was arrested and fined for having a listed organism in their possession. So number four, plants brought to Texas but no one knows why or when. We do not know who brought Taraxicum officinale, a yellow flowering sunflower called the dandelion. We don't know who brought it here. We don't know why they brought it here. So experience has shown that exotic invasive plant species do not understand how to live by the rules because they are not native to our ecosystem, but to another country and its ecosystem, they left their natural controls of diseases, insects, natural fire frequency, foraging animals, and exact soil and climate requirements. They left them at home in Germany. They left them at home in Japan and China. They're not over here. So there's nothing when an organism gets started, there's nothing to try to stop it. So our major problem with land management is our inability to recognize a true threatening plant species. We react 
because of financial loss, not necessarily to a negative impact to the environment. Money leads the way, not the environment or we wouldn't be doing many of the things that we're doing today with concrete, asphalt, more buildings, and rooftops. So foreign or exotic invasive plant species can best survive, reproduce, and advance on the same kind of soil disturbance and human management that produces our native weed and brush problems. This is also the same environment in which the landowner grows Bermuda grass and other introductions from other parts of the world. So look at this giant cane, the Carrizo cane. It's called giant reed. It's called Georgia cane, a rhododonax. It is a native of France and Spain. And it's growing right out there on the highway in some of the culverts between Colleen and Lampasas. And so the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Texas, California, New Mexico, Nevada, and Arizona, they're working to get rid of this non-native plant because as a non-native plant, it's not feeding any of our native wildlife. But it was brought here as a solution after the 1930s for soil and water conservation and to control erosion on our land. It was brought to solve a problem, and then it helped with the problem, but then it started reproducing and invading everywhere else. So now it is an issue plant. And we don't want any more of it because Texas Parks and Wildlife estimates that when you introduce a new plant that is not native to your area, it takes up to 200 years for a native animal to ever use it. So what are the two oldest examples of plants that have been in Texas for 200 years and wildlife will eat them? You ready? Oats and wheat. See, that's the two. But you can go get a clover. Go get the rose clover. Go get the crimson clover. Not native to Texas. The white-tailed deer lay down in it, but they do not take one bite of those clovers. So I must understand animal behavior. So look at this plant that has an oak-shaped leaf but it's in the nightshade family. It's tropical soda apple, Solanum biarum, and it's native to Brazil. And it now is on the invasive, it's on the federal noxious weed list. It's invasive to Texas, and it now occurs in five counties in the state of Texas. So when I see this plant, I'm going to work to stop it because the guy that got it first in 1998 over at Jasper, it took over his ranch and the plant grew taller than me under the pine trees. It, re it took away his fortune and land. So look in Texas, that was the federal view. Look at in Texas in 2004, we have Senate Bill 854, a bill that establishes the establishing the Texas Department of Agriculture as the authority for designating certain plant species as noxious and invasive. Typically, at the same level, Texas Parks and Wildlife will list animals as invasive. That department. So, Senate Bill 1854 provides the Texas Department of Agriculture the authority to publish a list of noxious and invasive plants with the consultation of industry, stakeholders, and pertinent state agencies. They don't just do it on their own. They bring in the people who have the same interest that may not even be in the government and include them in things that are going to be listed. I want to hear all viewpoints before I make a selection mistake. So plants will be placed on the noxious plant list as economic 
or ecological problems are identified. I've got to show a reason. I just can't take my favorite plant and stick it on the list. So here's the current list. There are 33 plants on the Texas Department list. And look, alligator weed, balloon vine, Brazilian pepper tree, broom rape, camel thorn, go all the way down to the bottom to water trumpet, water hyacinth, and water lettuce. These are the plants that you cannot sell at a nursery in Texas that are on this list because the law in Senate Bill 1854 only controls what we're selling. It doesn't put forward money to go out and attack the itch grass, Rothbolia cochiciensis, to go get rid of it. That is up to the private landowner. Landowners in Texas still have the right and authority to take care of their own land. They are the stewards of the land. They are the caretakers. Why does everybody sit back and wait for the government to do it? There's no law that says the government is going to come in and save you and get rid of the kudzu out of your backyard up at Lake Caddo. See, this, this isn't going to happen. So here's their list, and you can go look it up, and this is what the committee that I was on helps to change and build, and 33 species, maybe we can't handle any more economically under the current economic times. So what is our integrated approach here? from an IPM standpoint, while prevention is the most vital step in invasive species management, sometimes an infestation can't be helped. Once a noxious weed infestation has been established on your property, you've got to figure out what to do with it. That can be discouraging prospect. You might already be covered up with it. So, USDA APHIS says in their philosophy that early detection is most important. The minute I find something that's on one of these lists, take care of it now while the population is small. And I can go even in by hand and pull them all up and burn them in a barrel and get rid of them before they produce seed. So the fewer invasive plants you are dealing with often makes my management cheaper. So, for example, let's say you discover a musk thistle infestation, and musk thistle, Carduus nutans, is native to the eastern part of Europe and the western part of Russia, and it occurs in Texas. Since 1925, the first plant was found at Sonora, Sonora, Texas. So after doing some research and consulting local experts, you learn this plant seed survive in the soil for 50 years. And controlling them can be a daunting task. And so you find a method to mow them, to dig them up, but they've already been there for several years because you didn't see the first one that went to flower. And now the seed are in the soil and you kill every one of the living mother plants and next year, the plant is back because none of our herbicides that we use in broadleaf weed control or in brush management kill seed in the soil. That's not how they work in our biological system. So what's the issue here? Most of our broadleaf control measures kill live living plant tissue, whether it be weeds or brush. These herbicides are not meant or selected to kill seeds in the soil. We'll never get rid of that common broom weed because its seed are viable in the soil for a minimum of 15 years. Now, Cindy, I've got on my clock that I have eight minutes and then I'll wrap it up. I'll wrap it up with a well, three minutes left. Yeah, I was the same. Got a little bit less than that. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do it when you're ready. But just know okay. I'm watching my clock. Okay. okay, so look at the musk thistle. This is plant number four. We've gone through the broomweed. We've gone through the ash juniper and the mesquite. Now, here's the picture of this plant from Eastern Europe, Western Russia. 
Look at the, it's a cool season annual, and it's rosette stage is out there right now. Look at the lower leaves of this plant and see the jagged edges and the thorn on the tip of this thistle. Remember, there are 66 plants in Texas that have the word thistle tied to their name. Some are perennials, some are annuals, some are native, some are introduced. The word thistle by itself is meaningless because it doesn't qualify to tell me anything else about this plant. But that plant is in the sunflower family, first found in Texas in 1925, a native of Eastern Europe, Western. So look what Austin did in their revolution against non-native things. They, they put together a list for everybody and the developers and the people selling plants. These are plants that can't be brought in to Austin and planted within the city limits. Arizona ash, China berry, Chinese pistache, Chinese tallow, Chinese privet, elephant ear, kudzu, ligustrum, mimosa, nandina, English ivy, bamboo, tree of heaven, the salt cedar, the tamarisk. You plant them. You're going to be fined. You don't follow the rule, you'll be put in jail. This is what Austin was leading to with this list. And so do not plant near parks, preserves, or green belts. Don't plant bamboo. Don't plant English ivy. Don't plant the periwinkle vinca vines because they will invade our natural areas of parks, preserves, and green belts. So problem trees and shrubs. These plants are typically fast growing and highly ad adapted and often have weak wood and are short lived like our net leaf hackberry a native tree that only lives, uh, if it makes it to 50 years old, that's an old one. But I have oaks in Texas that are over 800 years old. And so, because these plants produce viable seed, and what if they blow on the neighbor's property, and the neighbor doesn't want this plant, can they sue you? Can they take you to court because you introduced one of these non-native plants on their land? Think about it. People are so happy today. So look at number five, the Chinese tallow tree. And this is a plant that was brought in by the horticulture industry, nursery industry, because the leaves go from green to yellow to orange to red to purple. And the guy that brought it in said, you know, it's ugly here in Texas in the fall. Uh, Y'all go from green to yellow to brown. Let's liven this place up. And he brought in the Chinese teletry. Can you tell what part of the world it's from by hearing its name? Chinese tallow tree. Chinese. This is a native of China. So you people still have it. And it's on that noxious weed list that Texas Department of Agriculture enforces. But look, here's a book from 1964 and the Western Gulf Regions book already talking about it and that the seed out of these capsules can drift with the wind for two to 10 miles away from the mother tree. That makes it highly invasive. So look at the Chinese privet hedge, number six, and look at its stems. And the only thing is non-native bees come up and forage on it to get nectar and pollen. And those non-native bees, they're from Europe and Asia. They're the ones that we brought over to pollinate all of our non-native food plants that we grow. So can you think of anything native to Texas that's for sale every day of the year at the grocery store? There's only two plants. You ready? Pecans and prickly pear. Everything else we call food at the grocery store is an introduced plant and not native to Texas. So here's what the flowers look like. Here's it's growing and taking over our fence rows. Here's the Brazilian verbena, verbena brasiliensis, that has a square stem and grows all the way west of Colleen now, 
and here it is growing along the chain link fence uh, and here's what the flowers look like being a verbena people think it's a native plant they don't do anything about it because they don't know which of the many verbenas it is so but total eradication isn't always a realistic and desirable goal when responding to an invasive species so we consider eradication but we also consider containment and we also consider suppression what is it we can afford to do? And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for having me as a guest speaker to your webinar today. And I look forward to coming back because in this PowerPoint, we have gotten through slide number 50. And this PowerPoint is 293 slides long. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll, uh, if you get any questions, then through our virtual librarian and working with Cindy Osser, please send, she will forward anything to me by email if that is a specific question for you that I can help you with. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Don't go anywhere, Dr. Rector. Okay, um, I'm because, still here. Um, we're going to have to go ahead and, and shut down quickly because we stopped. We started a little late. Yes. I just want to remind sorry everybody. No, it's okay. Um, we want to remind everybody this Wednesday we have another virtual event at noon. So make sure that you watch then. What we're going to do is we're going to stop the live stream. But um, thank you so much, Dr. Rector, for. My um, pleasure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. My, my oh, pleasure okay. to be involved, um, ma'am. For um, coming, you know, today, and what we'd like to do is when we stop the live stream, if you will give um, Alyssa, who is our virtual librarian, your information of any websites or any contact information, we'll put it in the um, the comment section, and that way we can continue on with that. Very so, good. Yes, well, thank you once again, and we truly appreciate it. We're sorry we got to go real quick, um, but we will we'll see everybody later. So, Alyssa, if you will take us out and um, don't leave yet, okay? Okay. <laughs>